Okay. Thank you, Gerard. Um, so, thanks for coming. Today, it is today's menu. I will start by talking about uh, the motivation and the the background of the of, of the study. And then I will move forward talk about the two case studies that we are currently analyzing. Uh, when I say we, I refer to myself as PhD students at the other research here at the University of Pavia and I at Pavia, and the research team at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. So we are studying two case study of, of port infrastructures, one located in center port in, uh, center port in Wellington, New Zealand, and the other one located in uh, southern Italy in the port of Gioia Tauro. And for the port of Gioia Tauro is the one that I, I am mainly involved, though we are we are working together with the team at UC to have a consistent framework of the analysis so that we do the, the, the same methodology, we put the same methodology, and we apply the same assumptions. Then I will move forward to talk about the characteristics and features of the analysis that we are conducting. And then I will present you the results in terms of the seismic response of a deep waters uh, wharf located in the Porto Gioia Tower in Southern Italy. And, there, and then I will move to show you some results from the Port of Wellington, in particular, some lateral spreading estimates that we are uh, lately having. Finally, some concluding re remarks. So first, uh, to give a brief context about what is a wharf. A wharf, as you can see here in the, in the image, this is the Porto Gioia Tower. Here, this, the, the, these container cranes are unloading or loading a vessel, and those cranes are mounted on a, on a deck, on a thick deck, and, those, and that deck is in turn supported on a series of piles. And this is a structure in which the, the, the cranes are mounted and which allows for the berthing and moving of uh, container ships is called a wharf. In this case, it's a large diameter pile support wharf here in Julia Tower in, in southern Italy. This uh, cross section of the, of the wharf that we're working with is a large diameter uh, pile support wharf, 1.5 meters of diameter. And so, and to carry on to, to continue talking about the motivation of the study, uh, wharves and seaport infrastructures, they have been badly hit uh, in recent years during strong ground motion uh, uh, events. Here in this picture, you can see what happened in the city of Port au Prince during the height year in 2010. Focus on the Grand, Grand Tri crane. This container crane, as you can see, is uh, partially submerged beneath the sea level because the, the wharf it was founded on a completely settled and, and slum into the sea. Because all the area of the port suffered from widespread liquefaction that manifested in lateral spread displacement, lateral spread displacements. Um, and if we look close into what happened to the crane, we can see the magnitude of the lateral spread in this case. The, the crack widths are of, of several centimeters, of the other seven centimeters. And you can say that you can see that the the whole area of the, of the pore actually more or less displays around a meter or one one meter or so. Now closer to the world where we are uh, studying, you know, why we are studying this in particular, during 2016, the Kaikura earthquake in Santin Port in Wellington, widespread liquefaction also also occur in the in the port area. That also resulted in lateral spread displacements of also of the order of uh, one meter of the eighty or eighty centimeters. Though so the consequences were not as dramatic as in the case of uh, of Haiti, mainly because the settlement, the vertical settlement, was not was not as uh, as high. But in this case, if you see here on the right hand side of the, of the slide, you can see the container crane. Actually, that container crane tilted about one degree or two point five degrees, and that was enough to render the port unusable for a long while. Uh, you can see here the crack width, also of several centimeters. In this case, the PDA recording in a nearby station of port was around 0.3 G, and the distance to the rupture was around 60 kilometers. So we were mentioning that before the Kakura earthquake in 2013, there was another earthquake, which was the Cook Strait earthquake, was magnitude 6.6. And after that earthquake, there was some instruments were uh, located in, in the port, and that's why we, there are a lot of um, information about the actual measurements of the liquefaction manifestation at the port. Another example of how liquefaction manifested in the side of the port, you can see that in all these pictures, you can see some mud, some sand, some uh, sand particles all, all across, uh, spread all across the port. That is uh, a manifestation that we call sand ejecta, which happens during, 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 during airspace when there is liquefaction. Liquefaction is triggered in, deep in the, in the hydraulic field the pore water pressure increases in such a way 
that the water becomes pressurized and, and finds its easiest path to the surface, and it carries particles, solid particles with it. So that's what we see in here, sign ejecta from uh, uh, as a consequence of liquefaction in the in the port of Wellington. So that brings us closer to the subject of the research. So the research is uh, is related to the seismic response of pile supported works. I didn't mention, but I will I will complete that later. That in the case of Wellington, the the wharf is a small diameter pile support of wharf. So in Joya Tower, we have 1.6, 1.5 meters uh, diameter. In Wellington, we have 0.5 uh, meters diameter piles. And well, so well uh, the scope of the, re the research is about the seismic response of pile support of wharfs in under the particular circumstances that the soil in which they are founded experience liquefaction and possible triggers. Uh, lateral spread, uh, displacements. So we are we're working in, in in an environment in which we are expecting large displacements to take place. And the other part of the motivation is uh, if we look from the from the side of which analysis analysis methodologies we have at our disposal. In particular, if we refer to the to the guidelines, seismic guidelines that may apply in this case, which stem from the Port of Los Angeles, the guidelines from the Port of Los Angeles, the guidelines from the Port of Long Beach, or the guidelines for the 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 Pacific uh, Institute uh, Navigation Institute guidelines. We can see that we from the, we can come from the simplest analysis, which is a factor of safety estimation using pseudostatic analysis based on the limit equilibrium method. We can move forward into the degree of complexity. We can talk about numeric sliding block method, but if we really want to account for the um, for the, the uh, performance of the piles and the deformation of the soil, maybe we can now start talking about simplified dynamic analysis. In the form of beam on nonlinear Winkler foundations, which are also known as the PY analysis. This, on the, in themselves, there is a wide range of uh, choices between this analysis. You can do an, a static analysis in so, so, uh, like in a pushover fashion. You can also do a simplified dynamic analysis using the, the results from a ground response analysis. Or if you have to handle the interact the, the pile response. Subjected to large displacements if, uh, due to lateral spreading, you're you're uh, left with few options, and one of them is the nonlinear dynamic analysis or time history analysis, which is what we are going to talk about today. So, what we what do we want to do with this nonlinear uh, dynamic analysis? We want to reproduce most of the formation that accounts for the nonlinear response of the soil of liquefiable soils, and we're talking about lateral spreading. And also, we want to account for the nonlinear response of a structure subjected to these uh, large displacements at different ground motion intensities. So first, I will give you an overview of the case studies so to, for you to know what kind of information we, we, we have at our disposal. So I will first briefly describe the port of the, the center port in Wellington, although I, my, my focus is on the port of Joya Tower. It's mainly on the port of Joya Tower. It will later become evident why we are also using the port of Wellington. So this is to recall what happened in Wellington during the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake. This is a plan view of the port of Wellington. The port of Wellington was built by land reclamation works. So coarse grain material was placed in the area of the port. Hydraulic fields were placed and the port itself was built on top of those hydraulic fields. Here you can see the shaded areas represent different fields that were placed at different times. The lattice one was placed in the 60s, 70s, which is this uh, light blue area here, which is the Thornton Reclamation Land. And in the Thornton Reclamation Land, we found the Thornton Container Wharf, which is the one we are uh, working on. This is a schematic of the uh, uh, displacement pattern that took place during the Kakura earthquake on top of the slide, you can see that the Thornton Wharf actually displaced around one meter towards the sea and settled around 50 centimeters. But also the entire area of the port suffered from large deformation, large displacements, an overall settlement of 30, 30 centimeters, and also lateral spreading in the other direction of the, of the reclamation land. Just to give you a sense of the scale, the reclamation land is, in the case of uh, Wellington, is about 480 meters uh, wide. So all these areas lumped for around uh, 30 centimeters during the 2016 Kaikura earthquake. Just a reminder that here we are talking about a small diameter pile. Now in the case of Joao Tauro, the, the Port of Joao Tauro shares many similarities, but also has a lot of difference with respect to Port of Wellington. It is located in southern Italy, and 
difference, the different, main difference for the Fort Wellington in terms of the construction process is that the Fort Ojeda Tower was excavated. This long channel you see, you see here, parallel to the Tyrrhenian Sea, was excavated. And then the water furnace structures were built during the excavation process or afterwards. So all of these shaded rectangles are the water furnace structures, so the structures in which the, the ship container vessels uh, load on those containers. The most important or the most critical uh, dock here is the BAF dock, which stands for Italian of Banquina Antifundali, Antifunda, which means uh, deep water dock. So this dock here is the only one capable to, 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 to move and berth large container ships because of the, because of the deep water that is, um, that is displaced on. This is the, uh, again, the cross section of the wharf. Now we have this plan view of the geotechnical site and site investigation uh, that that was that were conducted on the on the site of the port. Uh, there were at least two different investigation campaigns: one that took place in the early 2000s and one that took place in the late 2010s. And for this part of the port, for the southern part of the port, we have at our disposal at least six, six SPTs and a much larger number of uh, CPTs, so comp penetration testing and a standard penetration, penetration test. Let's now focus on the CPT here that were conducted close by to the to the wharf. I say close by, but though the distance to the wharf, the closest distance to the wharf might be between 20 and 30 meters. So we're looking at CPTs 489, 490, and 488. These are these, these profiles for you, for all those of you that are not familiar with these profiles. The first one here in the center, this, this profile is in terms of normalized, clean, clean sound normalized penetration resistance. So tip resistance of the device, the CPT device, which measures, you know, which is an indication of the resistance of the soil, of the, of the density state of the soil. On the right-hand side, you can find what we call the um, soil behavior type index which give you an indication of which type of soil you're dealing with. For instance, in this case, if you only look at CPT 190 and CPT 488, we are talking about coarse grain material, gravel materials. This is the IC is close to 1.3, down to 12 meters. From, from 12 meters to 20 meters depth, we're now talking about a, a coarse grain soil again, but with a, a larger, finer fraction. So it might be a sandy soil, Whereas on top of it, we may find a, a sandy gravel. Important is uh, the tip resistances indicates to us that from 12 meters down to 20 meters, we find a looser pocket of soils with respect to the upper 20, 12 meters. So this from, from the surface of 12 meter depth, we can find a more or less a relative dense soil. And down, down from this uh, depth to 20 meters, we find a looser soil. And now if we go back and look what happened with CPT 189, we find a, a complex picture because we we see now that these blue dots, these blue markers, are indicating the presence of a really, really loose soil. So to give you another magnitude, this, this soil has a liquefaction resistant ratio that is lower than the one that was found in, uh, in Wellington, the blue markers. So it is our interpretation that those blue markers belong to some pockets of soft deposits, or soft fields that were placed during the excavation of the of the of the channel that were placed there to replace the material that they over excavated or over dredged during those works. And now, if we look at a broader picture, if we compile all the CPT data that we have for this zone, the BA, the zone that is labeled as BAF, we find this uh, this situation in which. The CPT data is telling us that the soil deposit is rather consistent. We can identify that the, the presence against of the rather dense, dense uh, layer here between this case between five and 12 meters and between the surface and five meters depth and from 12 meters to 20 meters depth, we can find a, we will find a looser deposit. And that looser deposit is actually the one that is going to control the dynamic response of the of the wharf. This is the one that is going to trigger the compaction later on, depending on the ground motion intensity, and the one responsible for large deformations. So up to this point, the, the main the main takeaways from the characterization of the Porto Jura Tower of the southern port of the southern location of the Porto Jura Tower is that we find a rather consistent native deposit. And but within the native deposit we also found 
uh, pockets of softer material. And if we try to make difference between among themselves, the liquefaction potential index of the looser field is around 33, which is extremely high. Whereas the liquefaction potential index of the native soil, the mean value at least is 4.66, 4 and the standard deviation is around 3.7, 3.9, 3.8. Let's talk about the analysis. So again, what do we want? We want to reproduce most of the formations that involve large displacement due to liquefaction and lateral spreading. And how we are doing that, we are using the numerical tool FLAG, which stands for Fast Lagrangian Analysis of Continua. It's a finite difference-based code. It's an explicit solver, and it shares few similarities with finite, with finite elements at this point. It's, it's, a, it's a different type of solver. It's widely used in, for, in, in practice for by geotechnical engineers as well as in research, geotechnical engineering. And the, the appeal of, the, of using this code is that uh, you can implement all the advanced quality models for soils. That's what we are doing. Advanced quality models that handle large information and, uh, and can capture the response of liquefiable soils. So I will show you the what the methodology that we have followed to understand the behavior of the of the Port of Joa Tauro uh, by analyzing the native deposit. So this is the model here on the right. I will go into more details of the model uh, later. But first, let us let me tell you that we are going to analyze, okay, first this model that contains the wharf, the wharf without the crane, that is important. And another model that does not contain the wharf. So that, that model we're going, to call, we're going to call it the free field model. In order for us, it, that will allow us to identify or to make the distinction between kinematic and inertial effects more easier. And we're going to use a representative uh, ground motion re record scaled up for three different return periods, 200, 475, and 150 years return period. In order to give, you, give us also a, a more global, a more general picture of what, what, what can happen at the side of the board, we are also studying the response of the model containing the softer field, which is here, that is here on the left, on, on the right, sorry. So we are, we are first, today I will show you the results with one positive model, but we are also implemented another consistent model that has been developed by Professor Mirko Kurinoshi, but has been implemented by Wid Andreotti, a researcher here at the University of Pavia at ISSS. So we are using, I will tell you in advance, we're using in-house tools that have been developed for the past six to eight years. So this is the native deposit. The, the model head is uh, around uh, 85 meters. And it's uh, around 200, 250, 260 meters wide. The first 20 meters are, the, the properties of the first 20 meters are based on the CPT characterization, whereas the, the deeper layers where the, the properties of the deeper layers were selected based on previous studies and other types of uh, field measurements. So this is a summary of what we are doing in terms of the analysis. These are fully coupled planar stress analysis, fully coupled in your technical engineering means that we are analyzing what happens in terms of the stress and strain response of the soil, but also in terms of groundwater flow inside of, the, inside of the soil. So what FLAC does, it solves simultaneously balance of momentum equation, so equilibrium, and, and continuity of mass, so groundwater flow, uh, simultaneously. So that allows you to capture the effect of partial drainage and drainage condition during ground motion shaking which you wouldn't be able to do if you run a fully undrained analysis. So we are using PM for sun and SDM. I will tell you about later what those models are for the liquefiable layers. Also for the non-liquefiable layers in the more recent version of the iteration of the model, we're using them. For, but for today, I will, I will present the results uh, that we are getting when we use a conventional elastic plastic model for the non-liquefiable layers. The nonlinear, the nonlinear response of the piles were also modeled by a distributed plasticity model. So we are assigning plastic zones in the way of plastic hinges on, on the pile. And this, also the, the, the crane is not present, but we are lumping the mass of the crane on the deck of the wharf. This, this simplification is, is, is um, imposes limitations if we want to understand the response, the, the performance of the crane, but the overall response of the wharf and the submerged slope it has been shown that making this a simplification wouldn't be as dramatic and it's acceptable. So let's talk about the, the tools that we're using. 
PM for sound stands for plasticity for plasticity model for sound. It was developed at the University of California Davis, it, whereas the stress density model was developed by Professor Kurinoski and Professor Ishihari in 1998, and has been implemented in FLAC by by researchers here in the University of Pavia and ISSS. So this is the in-house tool that we have, and that we are currently learning more about it, learning more how to use it, and becoming uh, better users with it. Just to tell you briefly the, the main difference how these two models reproduce dilatancy. Dilatancy is the main property that makes soils um, respond in that makes soils that makes soil respond so complex because shear loads in soils can translate into volumetric responses. So during liquefaction during earthquakes, the shear stress induced by the ground move, motion, they excite the soil in such a way that loose soils tend to contract. So loose soil, when shear, they tend to contract. And this tendency to contract creates water pressure inside the soil because the drainage of, during the earthquake is relatively uh, small. And this excess of water pressure in turn causes a, uh, a reduction, dramatic reduction on the stiffness and the strength of the soil. And that is uh, the process of liquefaction. So what we, what we want to capture with this model is the evolution of excess for water pressure within the soil. This, so this business of shear and volumetric coupling within the soil, and the most important, and equally importantly, that this is compatible with the critical uh, state theory, so that we can capture the response of the soil along different density states. So let's say we can here you can see here that from the CPT profiles we can we have soils with a varying degree of density. We, are, we, we may have loose soils as well as slightly denser soils. And using critical state compatible or base models allow us to capture the response of those soils with different densities. How, this, uh, how these models are, have to, or are usually calibrated, they're calibrated based on the empirical relations for liquefaction triggering. So most of you must be uh, familiar with this type of curve where you have the some sort of uh, uh, either the tip resistance of the CPT or the low count from the SPT uh, that, that is dictating the cyclic, res cyclic resistant ratio at the normalized conditions of the soil. And this is what we call the liquefaction triggering curve. And that liquefaction triggering curve is what we use as a benchmark for the uh, calibration of the consistent model. So here on the left, on the, on the right-hand side, you can see two different sets of element tests, one carry out with PM for sun and the other carry out with stress density. So each set was carried out at confinement of one atmosphere. Confinement means that we take an element of soil and we are applying a vertical and orbital pressure of one atmosphere, 100 kilopascals, and then we're going to shear the soil. As we shear the soil, groundwater pressure within the soil evolves and that uh, leads to a reduction of resistance and strength. So you can see that this, this, this stress path that we call here at the right-hand side of the, uh, here when I have the, the, the pointer, evolves towards the left side of the, of the plot. So that means that pore pressure is building up and the way pore pressure builds up depends on how the model understands the latency. So this is an example of how we, we can handle epistemic uncertainty about the soil behavior in our modeling approach. Now, if we talk about how we model the, the structural behavior, so FLAC is a finite difference based code and it's, it's extremely good and it's, it offers a lot of, uh, it, got, it has a wide offer in terms of constituent models for soils and you can also do your own constituent models for the soil as we have been doing. But in terms of the uh, structural response is rather limited. So we, we don't know, they have also developed a, a model to capture the nonlinear response of a uh, pile and beam elements in flat. And the way it's implemented is, uh, is, uh, is as follows. So each plastic zone is composed by two segments. So two elements, two beam elements. Each element, um, the, the curvature of this, of this plastic zone is approximated by taking the, the difference between the relative rotations at both ends of the, of the plastic zone. And the moment curvature relationship is enforced as the middle, at the middle node. In this case, here at the bottom of this uh, cantilever beam, cantilever uh, column. And the, the, the way the, the model works, it reduces the stiffness of the, of the flat uh, built-in elastic uh, element so that it follows the, 
the moment curvature relation that, that were predefined. It also accounts for the stiffness degradation. So you can also capture the crack in the stiffness of the reinforced concrete section with the, uh, with, with the, this lump plasticity model. And the lump plasticity model was uh, calibrated validated against Simon's truck previously. And this here is the comparison in terms of the for displacement uh, results for a cantilever column with uh, seismic stroke. Now I, won't, I can tell you about the results that we're getting for Joya Tauro. So let's first talk about uh, the motion that will correspond to a return period of 175 years. On the left, you see the displacements contour of the free field model, so the model in the absence of the wharf. On the right-hand side, you can see the displacement contour of the model with the wharf. So bear in mind here the shape of the of the display of the model deformation that we are getting, around 40 centimeters here on the crest, and at, at the toe also around 40, maybe 60. And here you can see that at the toe is smaller, but at the crest we still have a more or less larger displacements. These are the distributions of maximum shear strains after 55 seconds. The motion is around 30 seconds long. We have we we leave we leave the the, the analysis to long um, to, to run for a longer time in order to capture the post uh, post liquefaction uh, strains, which is quite important. Here we have the distribution of maximum shear strains, and here we have the comparison now for two different types of return period. On 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 top you can see the motion of 175 years, on the bottom the motion of 950 years. So the model deformation changes in the free field model. First, for the 475 years, we have a model deformation that is basically consists of a toe failure. So the slope is failing at the toe. There is some lateral displacements, but with a stronger motion, the lateral spreading mechanism is triggered. And now in conjunction together with the toe failure of the slope, we also have a dramatic lateral spreading in the free field model. And how, the, uh, how it translates when we, when we set the piles into the model? We can see here that in, in the lower in, um, intensity motion also that the presence of the piles reduces the, the displacement here in this zone, but it maintains this, it keeps the same displacement level or even increases the displacement at the crest. So you can see that uh, on the dotted line, you can see a reduction of the displacements, whereas in this, and also here in this, uh, in the uh, far, farther away from the wharf, there is also a reduction of the displacements. But closer to the slope crest, there is an increase of maximum dis uh, final displacements. And what is this? First, this reduction of, uh, of this restraining action of the wharf against the lateral movement is called pinning effects. Pinning effects are only capturing this type of analysis. And what? And the other thing that we're capturing here in the crest is inertial inter interaction. So the presence of the mass of the deck and the dynamic um, the dynamic uh, movement of the, of the wharf increases the displacements at the surface level close to the wharf, but it restrains or it helps to restrain the overall failure mechanism. So, the previous one was the SD model? BM4SAN. With the SD model, uh, we, we haven't finalized the results, but the model deformation is different. We have a complete slump of the, of, of, of the free field model. Model is similar to what I'm going to show you in the next slide. So this is with the looser feel. A more or less same fashion of showing the results. Uh, on top, we have the previous uh, model, which is the native soil model. The, 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 the scale has been changed. On the bottom, we have the, the model with the looser fields. The scale now is for a maximum displacement of three meters towards the sea. So if we analyze the cross section of the, of the wharf that is comprised by softer fields without the presence of the wharf, there is a um, dramatic displacement towards the sea of three meters in the case of the loose fields. If we have, if we place a wharf, we, we can see again this, the, the pining effects or the, the pinning effects or the restraining effects of the, the presence of the wharf, but this, this picture on itself doesn't tell the whole story. Actually, the, the wharf fails. The curvature in this, in the, in this pile, the, the demand on this pile is sufficiently high to reach failure. And it's, it's, a, it's a kinematic uh, driven failure. It's driven by lateral spreading. And now this is uh, for the, for the um, native soil deposit. 
what I'm showing you here on the left is the the, the, the distribution of the maximum bending moments. And the, the orange dots are the locations in which the moment curvature relationship are enforced. The blue blue squares are are the are the nodes that are used to to enforce that uh, the moment curvature relationship, but the only accuracy is only achieved at the at the orange dots. This is the reform shape of the wharf with the native deposit at the with the ground motion with the motion of 475 years. This is the recorded the histories of a bending moment here at the pile deck. And we are talking about the trailing pile. The most demanding pile is the pile uh, closer to the land. This is, these are the moment, uh, bending moment time history as recorded at, at the pile deck connection. This is the moment, moment relative rotation uh, uh, response. But if you go below the we go below the ground level, what happens is that you can see that the pile, the pile is almost loaded monotonically. This is a this is a known effect that close the closer you get to the deck the most inertial interaction uh, effects are dominated. The more you go down deep inside the soil, the more uh, the more is uh, the response is more driven by kinematic interaction effects. Though this varies from different return periods, uh, I will show you later. If we, if we excite this this model with a higher intensity motion, the kinematic effects take over, and they lead to failure. For instance, uh, this is this is the result in, in case of the for the motion of 475 years. This is the result in terms of uh, bending moment rotation relationships. Whereas if we excite with a with a larger moment with a larger motion, we reach failure mainly driven by kinematic effects. So the displacement of the soil of the of the of the, slo the sloping ground is is exerting extremely high demands on the piles, and it leads uh, it can lead to failure. In this case, no. But in the case of the loser field, it does. Uh, here, this left, this plot on the left are just illustrative to tell you the amount of uh, GR, uh, GR deformation that we have in these soil elements in the free field. In the free field means far away from the from the wharf. Well, I, I use free field for two things: free field for the model without the the wharf, wharf, and sometimes you also use free field to refer as the far field. When I say when I say free field here, I'm referring to the far field. Well, not that far, but it's far enough. And now, if we look at in the res results in terms of final final displacement shape, so the the profile for the for the trailing pile, the solid lines are the the final displacement that are, that we obtained from the free field analysis of so the model without the work. So you can see here that this this layer that is shaded here is the one driving the deformation. This is a liquefiable layer. And here, the, the dotted lines are the, the deformed shape of the pile. Finally, to highlight is here the final plot here on the right, which is in terms of ductility demand for the trailing pile. So we have that on the that the the, the uppermost hinge is 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 the one is one of the most uh, one of the most uh, demanded, but also the the hinge located at the interface between a dense and a loose soil. It's also been it's also been highly demanded, especially in the higher intensity motion due to lateral spread in deformation. It's worth mentioning that for the lower intensity motion, the lower uh, intensity motion of 200 years return period, we have this uh, this demand, this uh, the profile of the utility demand, and for that motion in particular, uh, liquefaction was not triggered. So liquefaction was triggered for the higher two higher intensity motions. And that's why we're having this shape, uh, higher demand here and in the interface between medium and then soil. Just to, this is this was the local response in terms of the super structure. This is the local response in terms of the soil. So first here on the right, what you will expect in the 1D model or in a model with a, a, a rather a small lateral heterogeneities. Is you will see that the liquefaction manifests, and you, you, you see a progression, the shear strains. You see these loops of the stress path that you have a, a full built up port water pressure. But then, as you move closer to the wharf, the situation is different because the soil is loaded, is pre loaded with a shear stress before the check, before the ground motion starts. It is already loaded by a shear, a static shear stress. And this static shear stress 
the, the, the main effect of this that it, it uh, predisposes the soil to go into a dilative state. So dilation uh, tends to occur when you, it is more, it's stronger when you have a driving static shear stress, whereas contraction happens at level ground. So that's, a, that's another important issue of, of why we have this different, there is a wide difference between a 1D model that does not take into account the presence of a driving shear stress, while here we have a driving shear stress because of the shape of the slope and also because of the presence of the piles. This is a model of the, on the loose field, the same uh, way of plotting the results. In this case, we reached the limitation of a long plasticity model because we cannot capture the post-failure response of the work. This high ductility demand is indication that failure was reached of the, of the, of the work, but we don't, right now the analysis don't have the capability to go in beyond failure because there are a lot of limitations for flag in terms of time step. If, you may, if we make the, the modeling of the, of, the, of the piles using finer uh, discretization, we penalize a lot the computational costs in flag, at least in flag. This is finally, uh, this was for Joya Tauro. Now for the port of Wellington, why we are using the port of Wellington or why I, I will use the port of Wellington? So all of this framework for modeling the, the wharf and the soil is in, and the, in the same model to obtain reliable estimates of, kinem of uh, kinematic and inertial loads um, needs uh, to add robustness to the conclusion of these studies. We need a case, a, a case in which we can compare our results with actual measurements. So by applying the same methodology, modeling the modeling approach, modeling methodology for the, for the port of Wellington, for the center port of Wellington, we can use it as a validation case for our, for our, for our methodology. And in this case, what you see plotted here on the, on the left upper side of the, of the slide is the distribution of ground, lateral ground deformation with distance from the waterfront. The gray lines are the measure, the crack width of measurements. So here you can see this, this, this uh, plan view of the Thornton Wharf in Wellington. We have this, uh, this cross, this uh, red cross sections. Along these cross sections, crack width were measures. And by summing up all the crack width measurements, we, we have a measurement, an actual measurements of the lateral uh, displacement. And we compare this with our results with SD and PM for SAN. And so far, we can we have encoded the results that at least near the waterfront, we have a reasonable estimates given by both PM for SAN and SDM. There is, of course, some variability. We can expect that our further results can, can, can fall in whatever range between these two uh, black and red dotted, dotted lines. Some, some concluding remarks is that the main kinematic effect that we have captured for the Port of Joya Tauro, at least for the uh, native soil uh, model, is pinning effects, pinning effects in the way of the restraining of the, of the, of the failure by the, by the wharf. And that the, the, the inertial effects were also, uh, were also identified in the way that the displacements of the, of the, of the crest of the, of the, of the, of the wharf, of the slope, were increased due to the presence of the of the inertial uh, movement of the of the mass of the deck, and if we also study what happens with the softer the presence of softer fields, we get lateral displacements of the order of three meters, so six times the native soil, and that poses a lot of questions about the out of play behavior of the wharf, and uh, that is actually part of the. Future work will be to study the out of the 3D response of the work where you have the, this variability of the soil deposit. Because if we see here that three meters seems rather critical, but we have to remember that this pocket of salt soil is confined by the native deposit nonetheless. So that will restrain the final movement. So what we are working on, what we continue working on is once we have a finalized model, we have delve more into the details of how kinematic and inertial effects are combined or are interacting among themselves. So you, you find in design guidelines, they recommend either 100, 100 and 100% 100 combination of kinematic loads and, uh, and inertial loads uh, as they are estimated from simplified analysis. 
And the, we are also going to capture different modes of deformation by assuming different densities of the of, of the deposit by uh, analyzing what happens when we uh, check the the models with a different density state of the soil that that determines the the model deformation that they, we we will get. These are some references. Um, thank you. So um, thank you, Ricardo. Very nice presentation and uh, fit exactly within the time. So um, I guess we'll have some time for some questions. Uh, just for people at home, uh, if you want to ask a question, you can just uh, write it in the chat maybe or try and turn on your uh, speaker. Uh, not sure which will work first, but to get things going, I guess I will start with um, one question. So you mentioned um, when you're doing your analysis, right? And then you saw some of the lateral deformations, the different kinds of modes of failures, but you mentioned even on your last slide that you had deformations of up to three meters, which is, is quite a lot. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So I'm just wondering, is, a, a lot of your work tended to focus a bit on analyzing and seeing what would happen, right? But imagine you were the owner of that port or that wharf and you saw three meters coming out of the analysis. What kind of stuff could you potentially do, or what? What is the threshold to say this is too much, or, or now we need to do something about it? Um, it's a very general question. But... Yes, but in this case, uh, we are we probably didn't explicitly mention it. We are analyzing a conservative scenario in which these other structures are not included inside the model, which is a tie back and a re and retaining wall that are placed behind the work. So you can say that it's an anchor some sort of anchor that is also placed behind the wharf. And including this into the continual modeling, it will be adding another degree of uh, complexity that we are not really uh, sure about what how it will interact with the other components of the analysis. So what they can do, but the owner of the of the of the board, the board authority, what they can do, I think they have already done it. They have installed also another set of uh, retaining structures along the along the wharf. Oh, okay. It's not uh, continuous, though. Sure, sure. But they have. Sure. Uh, there are some. You can find some other retaining structures in the in the site. Okay. Any yes, Carlo. And in addition, uh, they perform two D and not three D analysis. Of course. Yes. Can you for the third dimension? Sure. I want to ask a question about not this premature. It's from the start. Uh, you mentioned the differences between the drill power core and the wire core core in terms of different uh, types space. Based on what you have learned so far, that is the wire type of drill power. Um, would you suggest for the given uh, core to with a large spacing work for the pipes or like uh, Small diameter The feeling that I am getting is that the, the pinning effects, the restraining effects, we take more advantage of those by having larger than a meter pyres and spreading at, at uh, lighter distances. Because what we have seen in Wellington is that the wharf moves with the soil, that the slumping of the soil actually drives the, the wharf away from the from the sea. That actually what happened in a high tea. In the port of Prince port, that was the model deformation. So, in a way, we also have to design now that we also have to think about the design of these piles, um, thinking about they are also restraining possible sliding. And large diameter piles are very good at it. Okay. Any other question or comment? Yes, Dennis. So, for example, show us pictures where we have this size. It comes to this one. It's a plain book of specific. So, I'm just curious about the following strategy. How we should proceed. For example, yes, uh, in the picture, that's the one on the left. left yeah, this. Yeah. So, for example, imagine that uh, you are using a kind of non plastic steam. And you know, non plastic steam will kind of um, 
makes an assumption on the thing that can it back off higher higher region. Um, first of all, how would you decide uh, from a mission higher and how they are compatible with soil that is compact? And would you um, consider a special height of those each regions? And would you consider changing the water temperature, adapting temperature results uh, for each? Okay. Yeah, I understand it. Okay, so first, um, the way the, the model works, so that with the modeling slide that we have followed, the, the nodes of the pile are attached to the grid, the finite difference, right? So they share displacements. So there are, there are no relative displacements between the pile, the pile and the soil at this stage. And the other thing is that uh, in terms of the spacing between the elements, this was more a practical decision than um, because in finite difference, reducing the, the size of the of the of the element, bear in mind that we are talking about concrete piles, and the stiffness of a concrete pile is several order of magnitudes higher than the stiffness of soil. So you will have a several orders of magnitude smaller uh, time set that you will have to use in order to solve the problem, and that will create a lot of computational burden. So we came at a compromise in which, um, and I'm going to the other point you were making. We distribute a plastic hinge along the length of the of the, of the pile so that the, the failure was not uh, predisposed priorly, a priori, but they, it can develop naturally within the pile. Though we understand that we are not using the a finer mesh because of the limitations in terms of time step. And finally, for the last point you made, uh, as, as it is now, the, the long plasticity model only considers the an homogeneous uh, material. So in this case, all the hinges are assigned with the same moment uh, moment curvature relationship, though it is dependent on the actual load. So in a way, all the hinges can mobilize different resistance based on the actual load, but the the, the parameters, the model parameters of all the hinges are the same so far. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's quite the problem in the sense that, for example, let's say, for section, there's a lot of hinges section, let's say. That based on the plastic hinge, the energy space is different. Yes. So I was maybe thinking that there should be special methods to calculate based on, let's say, it's perfectly okay to pick a size based on the computational cost, but maybe we think we should also take an additional step to make sure that the energy space is as far as we expect. So in terms of the hysteretic response of the hinges, we, we run some sensitivity analysis of the model with different length of the of these zones. And we found that this length we have, even though coarse, it captures more or less the, the hysteretic response of finer hinge. But we cannot capture the post-failure response. That, 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 is some, that is indeed a limitation of a coarse uh, mesh. We cannot do that. So for the purpose of what we're of what we're doing, knowing that once uh, a failure is flat. Uh, this type of dramatic failure, like in the loose soil, is flat. For us, is enough to know that failure has occurred. We at this point, uh, is is the failure is so dramatic that the, we couldn't go forward to know what happens afterwards. Um, just on the modeling of the the piles, while you're mentioning them, you're mentioning a flexural element. But do you ever have any issues of shear, given the kind of movement that's happening, or is it something you? Yes. That uh, the model also considered shear failure shear capacity. Okay. So we can know when shear failure occurs. We can it, it is flat, but we don't know what happened afterwards. Sure. So the, the model cannot uh, go okay. that beyond that. But yes, the model considered a shear capacity of the cross section, especially in the pile deck connection. Those are the 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 most demanded uh, uh, points in terms of shear. Okay. We have a question online from Miriam Mas Masafard. So. Um, the question is related to the modeling of the interface elements who used for the pile soil interaction and the types of boundary conditions used in the model. Um, and also about the method of applying the ground motions in the model. Are they recorded in depth uh, or are the motions recorded on the ground surface? Okay. Two motions in one. 
Yeah, so this, I will try to answer. Okay, so here, first I will answer about the boundary conditions. So on the lateral bounds of the model, we have uh, devised these uh, columns that you can see here, these free field elements. We call it free field elements. What they are, they are one, these soil columns that are that run in parallel to the main grid. And the, the response of this 1D column is used to apply real-time force, constraining forces along the the, the length of the, of the of the boundary. And that is a, the basic formulation of a free field boundary condition that is allowed to um dissipate uh, that is allowed to dissipate the, the energy of the waves coming outside the model. That is we are using the basic uh, this meta and uh, formulation for this case. And for the base of the model, the model is uh, decomposed in real time and it is applied at the base of the model. It is decomposed again in the 1D model. So the 1D model works, the, the base of the 1D model is a compliant base, in, in a way it's a dashboard. So we can apply the outcrop rock motion. So the, the motion that was recorded on outcrop in rock conditions, we apply that motion at the base of the model. It is decomposed in real time and apply at the base of the, of the, of the main grid of the model. Uh, Volker? Uh, sorry, the, the interface elements. As I mentioned before, we are not using interface elements. We are assuming that the pile moves um, without relative displacements of with the main grid. So the pile and soil are attached, the grid points are attached. Yes, Volker. Just curious about um, the elements of the pile and actually. Do we have some sort of contact elements between uh, elements? No. Or just they just share the same node. They share the same node. Um, the reason we haven't done that is because we already explored the effects of uh, several orders of complexities that we have added to the model. And it will be harder for us to interpret the results if we add another source of energy dissipation that we actually don't know how to calibrate. Because if you, if you, if you know the P, this, these interface elements are quite tricky to calibrate. We can calibrate advanced soil consistent model based on uh, well-known empirical relationships, but the relationships for these interface elements can, at this point can be anything. Uh, Sabinos? Yeah, so this is one, I was just wondering how many grams of this are going to be Okay, I'm using, I'm showing just one result of a one gram motion. This gram motion is represent, representative of the hazard of the side because it's a near a near source gram motion that was recorded in outcrop conditions. So um, outcrop and rough conditions for the case of the Norcia sequence of 2016. And uh, it's a strong motion, rather a strong motion. It's, it's compatible with a return period of 175. So from that, I scaled that motion to match 950 year return period and scale it up down to match uh, 200 year return periods. Parallel to that, there are, there are also some analysis that we are going to, we are making with um, uh, ground motion selected with a uni compatible with the uniform hazard spectrum. But uh, that's something we have done at the 1D level. We haven't done it at the 2D level. We have the motions, but we haven't done the analysis because we, we, we haven't yet finalized. We, have, we haven't yet happy with a final model. With pm 4 sun we we seem to have an agreement that it is running, but with the, SD, with the stress density model, we still have some details to finalize. And after that, what, what continues is to run the, the set of analysis with different graph motions. Something that we were focusing on the mechanics, but certainly um, one of the possible uh, say, objectives of the search would be to identify the optimal destiny um, for the work. Of course, it depends on what uh, component of the work for the Would be 
Yes, yeah. that's an idea. Yes, right now we are we're focusing on the finalizing our, our work with our in-house tools that we are quite proud of. And we are that's one of the practical objectives to have a complete product in terms of our in our own tools that we have developed for flat. And after that, we can start testing all of these uh, issues. Yes, I did also, we're also using, I'm also using a global sensitivity analysis. So in, in a way we can see the interactions between different parameters rather than looking at one single parameter at the same time. And for instance, we found out that hydraulic conductivities play a role when they combine, the, the, their combined effect is more important than a single effect, but that's another, that's, that's another thing, yes. Okay. Well, the question I have, I uh, is there any specific reason you usually go for a specific analysis? Is it because of convergence issues? Potentially occurring? Okay. Is it analysis or is it just black? It's doing that. Black, black only runs that way. Black is explicit by nature, it's a tiny difference. So it is, it's, Lag, it's Lagrangian by, by nature. So it's, that's how it works. So we, we cannot modify that by, by any means. I'm just thinking of like all the software and all the And then the advantage of that is that you can model large information. Maybe one final question, and then I think we're just out of time. Is um, so we're mentioning ground motions in the analysis, and it's clear that the presentation had a different focus on understanding the mechanism and the and the tools you're developing. But just if you want to take that further, like uh, Carla has just said. Uh, how much time are you talking about for one single analysis with one single ground motion? I mean, roughly speaking. At this stage, it, it's a it's a process. When you when you start with the, the, uh, tuning a tool, it can take two days because you have to set up everything the most inefficient but most accurate way possible. So with SD, it can take two days, one day and a half, just okay. uh, thirty five or forty seconds. With PM for Sun. We have tested and we can we, we can force it to six, eight hours. Okay. But it's forcing it. We we do that with SD, we we we, we get crazy results, but with SD we're going at a, a different pace. So you can start off with two days and then understanding how things work. And then you make adjustments inside how the constitutive right. model works and that, that that can be done. But uh, um what we have found is that uh, it's it is between depends on the on what your assumptions. It's between eight hours and one and a half days. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all we have time for. So again, we say thanks again to Ricardo for a nice presentation. So. Thank you. Okay. So thank you to everybody joining from home, and uh, I guess we'll end it here.